everyone, uh, those of you joining us in TASA's Vancouver headquarters and those of you joining us remotely, we are absolutely thrilled to announce the launch of the TASLAP Integration Hub today. So I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of why we did this and, and what we've got coming. Nicole Bryan, our VP Products, is going to give you a, a demo of the tool. And then we're going to have some customers join us for presentations of the panel. So Jacqueline Smith, Senior Director of Technology and Product at Comcast, uh, Carmen Diardo, Technology Director in the Delivery Pipeline Owner at Nationwide. And Mark Wan is a technology executive who, uh, the financial services company who presided over one of the, and created one of the most interesting large scale agile transformations and in initial task up deployments. So in terms of you know, how we've, the journey that we've all been on, I think we, we all know that agile and DevOps have come of age and these technologies are critical and these approaches and the cultural movements behind them are critical to succeeding with large scale software delivery. Uh, the only problem is that we're seeing them work really well at startup scale and at, at technology, you know, at, for new technology companies. But we keep hearing stories. The more that you go to different customer sites, as, as has been my case, the more you hear about these things not matching up exactly to what we've been hearing at, 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 con at all conferences. So just a few examples of the kinds of symptoms that we're seeing. Uh, a top 10 global bank, over 35,000 IT staff, so a little bit more than your typical startup, they're on their fourth transformation initiative and it keeps failing, it keeps not succeeding, despite the best funded efforts and leadership who's completely behind this transformation. On the flip side, if you look at this other bank, uh, top, it's a glo top 15 global bank, 20,000 IT staff, they didn't have a top-down agile or DevOps transformation initiative, they, uh, about a year ago, ran a network monitoring tool. They noticed 150 JIRA servers on their network. So somehow it happened literally underneath them with all these JIRA servers popping on the, up under people's desks because, of course, developers want to build code in a new way and be more happy and more productive in their day-to-day -day delivery. And we just see these stories all over the place. Some, another organization's trying to emulate Netflix stack, whereas their software portfolio is about 100 times more complex than that of Netflix, not to mention they have 100 times more staff. Uh, automotive companies, it's happening all over the world. And really what we're seeing is that the old mentality, the old way of looking at software delivery is just not working. So this notion that we will have an, another end-to-end -end platform, that one vendor, something like the rational unified process, it's going to con connect all of the people and processes and tools involved is not happening because agile, DevOps, and, and really the move to cloud for a lot of organizations is all about best of breed tools and all about choice. And if you look at some of the tools that involved in the tool chains of our customers, it's, it's almost been too much choice because we've now got four agile tools in some organizations and more in others. But the bottom line is this movement has happened and it's not changing. It's actually getting more best of breed. We're seeing, for example, requirements management tools specialize even further. And the end result that we're seeing at every one of those organizations who failed in their transformations is these fragmented value streams where these best of breed tool chains are causing these disconnects from bringing business value that's, that comes from business initiatives, some great new application idea somebody has, to delighted customers and, and revenue results for the company. So each one of these, these red splotches represents a lot of manual waste and a lot of handoffs. We know that DevOps and Agile are all about bringing people together across organizations, across countries, uh, and having them collaborate across these systems and tools, even at these very large scales. So the big problem with this is each of those handoffs is just opening the door, each of these, these broken processes, to disruption. Organizations that don't fix these problems, that don't get rid of that waste, that, that first bullet point, there was two hours of manual entry for developers having to update requirements and chain set links and tickets and other regulatory reasons that got in the way of their work. We have to get rid of this, or again, you will just open up the door to disruption by every startup who's actually figured this out, because the interesting thing is the startups have, and now the problem is how to scale that. This manual entry is, again, a tremendous cause of waste. And for the last 10 years at TaskDop, we've been looking at how to take out that waste. So this started out with our journey in open source with Eclipse Mylan and TaskDop Dev. TaskDop Sync solved this at the infrastructure layer, at the, basically on the server side. But we realized that we were hitting a dead end in terms of how we were having people connect these different tools. And so in 2013, we started work on our next generation platform, our next generation approach to integration. We created our own internal integration factory that was based on these models of how we knew that the value stream worked on these core concepts of things like requirements and defects and user stories and security vulnerabilities. We released some of that with TaskUp Data and then with TaskUp Gate Gateway, which allows us to plug in all these different DevOps tools. And now, today, we're actually releasing the, the unified offering of the TaskUp Integration Hub, where we bring you this entire new approach to connecting your software delivery value stream. So really what we're seeing is it's the end of the road of all these point-to-point -point integration approaches. The, the 
tools that we have right now, the processes at scale, they're just far too complex to connect things in a point-to-point -point way. You get in this, to this exponential complexity, and as soon as you try to bring this approach and this, this connected value stream to more projects, it all breaks down. We need modular tool chains where we can bring both those, use the existing tools we have today, but bring the new tools that are gonna make our practitioners more productive. We need to make those practitioners happy and productive by giving them those tools rather than pushing those tools top down, as that's often a, a source of the failure. And with all of that, while focusing on the practitioners, we actually need that end-to-end -end visibility, traceability, and governance, because that's, that's the only way to work at large scale. And so that's our whole approach to value stream integration. And to do this, we actually have to take a, a very different view of things because we know open standards have not worked connecting these tools. We know that the things that come in the box with many of the agile tools, the DevOps tools, things like the bit of webhook functionality for connecting these tools together have resulted in you know, the new mass of spaghetti code that DevOps engineers and, and our IT teams deal with. So we actually create this new concept of model-based integration where those common models, the currencies of software delivery, the currencies of collaboration across our our Agile and DevOps and business analysts and support teams and security teams are, have actually now become a core part of the product where you author those value stream concepts in the tool rather than in this example over here as you see tr trying to translate every tool's model to every other tool's model which gets very complex as soon as you have three or four tools you're actually bringing this together into a common model and then connecting all, all those tools together as we see was the way of simplifying trans, uh, translation. So just in terms of the reduction of complexity for our customers, one customer actually went from 211 sync mappings to four integrations uh, through the TASTAP integration hub. And you'll see in a moment how that works. The whole goal, and Nicole's gonna show you this in a moment, is to have this end-to-end -end connected value stream where no matter what tools you have, you've got all the way from business idea to running software and delighted users connected through these different flows. So with that, Nicole, uh, why don't you show us how this works? Cool. I couldn't be more excited to be here today to show off uh, Tastop Integration Hub. So um, really, our mission was very simple. The mission was how can we make flowing information between all of these tools as simple as possible? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna first show you a, a common scenario that we see in organizations today. So <clears throat> here you see an organization that is using JAMA um, for their business analysts. And they're using JIRA for their development tools, for their developers. Um, they're using Git as well. Um, and then HP Enterprise for, um, for their testing group. So business analyst starts out and um, creates a requirement in JAMA. And through Tasktop Integration Hub, we flow that requirement over into JIRA as an epic. At that point, the developer is able to do their work in the way they want to do their work, is, which is to break down those epics into stories. And at that point, we flow the entire stream, um, hierarchy included, over into HP. That way the testers have the tools at their fingertips to be able to write good tests. So the developers go off and they start writing code, and through Tasktop Integration Hub, we automatically um, uh, link those change sets to the actual stories. The tester then can go off and do his tests. Last but not least, shockingly, he finds a defect, which never happens, I'm sure, but he finds a defect, and then we flow that defect along with the relationship to the story back into uh, JIRA. So this is the kind of complex integration scenario that we're capable of, of handling with Tasktop Integration Hub. So with that, I'm actually gonna go ahead and show you this. So here you see Tasktop Integration Hub. And the, that entire integration scenario um, turns into six integrations. And one of the things we tried to do is make it simple and consistent. So all of these integrations are configured the same way. I'm gonna go into one particular integration the HP to JIRA defect flow. Um, as Mick mentioned, we are focused on model-based integration. So what you see here is that these are all flowing through a defect model. But again, we're trying to be smart and out of the box, so we also provide uh, out-of-the-box models of the most common artifact types that people tend to want to flow. So we go back to our integration configuration. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this collection of defects. The magic, the secret sauce behind how we're able to do such complex integration simply is, to, is based on these models. So what I wanna point out first is that you notice this collection has only one project in it right now. Keep that in the back of your mind. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna map myself to the model. And again, we try really hard to be as smart as possible. The depth of knowledge we have of the 50, 51 tools that we connect to now 
um, really shows in the way that we're able to automatically map things to the model so that you don't have to do as much work. So you see that here. We also have the smarts to go in and pre-map for you um, single select values, but of course you can then on your own decide that you want fixed to be mapped to to-do. And there you go. Now you've got your, your uh, complex integration configured. So with that, let's come back to the projects. I mapped myself to the model, but the real magic is once I want to scale up, all I have to do is come in and add the projects of interest, and boom. I have now applied that same mapping to hundreds of projects at, at your fingertips. It's just as easy as that. So we can go ahead and save that. So now what's key is that you need to be able to have your flow match the way you do your work. So it's important that you have a series of controls that allow you to, at the, at the, with simple point and click, to configure the flow you want. Ranging from things like, well, do I want defects to flow in one direction or in two directions? <clears throat> in this case, I've chosen one direction, but I can easily change it to two. You can configure the field flow down to the attri attribute level with sophisticated abilities like saying whether or not you want to update this nor always, sometimes, only on creation. A lot of sophistication because we all know that large organizations have complex processes that need to be met. Let's say that you don't, in fact, want to flow all of your defects, but rather just a subset of them. Again, without having to go into code or XML files, I can say, you know what? I want only defects that have a severity of, uh, that are high priority, SEV1. Those are the only defects that I want flo flowing. Boom, in a few clicks, I've got that working. Now I'd like to go talk a little bit about some of the other magic, um, uh, some of the other magic we have. Comments, flowing comments is as easy as a couple clicks. Fabulous. Same with attachments. And now I want to talk about one of the most powerful aspects that we have, and that is the ability to do complex routing between, um, between projects. So here I'm showing a simple static routing. I want every defect from, map, uh, from mobile app project to go to test project A. But let's say that's not actually how my, my organization works. So let's delete that route. And let's say that I actually want to route that to three different projects in JIRA. I'm going to connect those, and the system is smart enough to say, okay, great, you've said I want, you to, I want to route everything from map app project to these three projects, but based on what? And we allow you to do sophisticated things like conditional routing. Well, I'm going to inspect those defects, and based on the component, um, the, the component value, if it's front end, I want it to go to test project A, back end, test project B, or if it's a database, test project C. So again, now I've been able to configure a fairly complex set of, of criteria um, with, just a few, with just a few clicks. And now I've shown you all the different controls you have at your fingertips. And just to uh, uh, reiterate, all of these other config integrations are configured the same way. So hopefully you'll agree that we've met our goal to make it simple, easy, and dare I say fun to configure integrations. Can I say fun? I don't know. <laughs> So with that, I'm going to hand back over. Thank you, Nicole. So yeah, this just scratches the surface what's what's come in the product. Check out the website for more videos and, and a lot more of, of what we've done here in terms of making integration, as Nicole says, almost fun and uh, easy. And in the end, making it possible to connect your value stream to start this in an hour, but to scale up to hundred, hundreds of projects very easily. So I think with that, we'll switch over to Carmen. Um, who's going to tell us how some of these concepts have played out at the DevOps and Agile transformation at Nationwide. Thanks, Mick. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've implemented some of the cap current capabilities and how I believe uh, you know this product will certainly uh, enable us to do some more exciting things in the future and fun things in the future. Um, so my role at Nationwide is sort of I'm the um, capability, technology uh, capability leader and I also am the product owner for our delivery pipeline. So um, my job is really to try to figure out how we can make things work better across our delivery value stream. 
So I'm going to start out here with a slide from the State of DevOps Report 2016, and especially the second item. So if you're not familiar with that report, I, I suggest you read it, um, produced by uh, IT Revolution, and, and I think you can find it on the internet. Um, and it talks about the fact that it, teams and companies who are able to have some of the results they talk about there in terms of productivity and lead time, uh, quick lead times, all have this uh, ability to have visibility across their flow of work. So it says the flow of work, and it's not just from committing code, it's from the business concept, right? It's, it's kind of like as Mark Schwartz talks about in the Art of Business Value, the, the value hypothesis, right? So the customer has an idea, as an experiment, if you will, you want to run, and you want to be able to deliver that and get feedback as quickly as possible. So that really requires a visibility of that work all the way through your value stream and to understand at any point in time what's the status of the products and the features that you're delivering. Um, so you know, I like to use the analogy of driving, right? It, you can have a great car and you can be a great driver, but if it's foggy and you can't really see the road, you're gonna slow down because you don't have that visibility and you really don't have that feeling of, of trust in how you know things are working. So visibility is a very important aspect of continuous delivery. So if you look at accelerating delivery, um, you know this is kind of our model and where we're trying to go. We're trying to become more responsive to the business. And you'll see at the bottom of kind of our DevOps house there is the three ways uh, that come from Gene King's The Phoenix Project. And then you'll see we have practices and cultures, which um, I'm not going to go into in detail, but they're things you're probably familiar with in terms of continuous integration, continuous del delivery, you know, version control, everything. But there's a key component there that everything's built on, which is that continuous flow and visibility. So again, those lean concepts and understanding your value stream is important to actually being able to have a successful DevOps transformation. So here's kind of our high level view of our value stream. And again, it starts with the business and ends with the business like any value stream. It always starts with the customer and ends with the customer. And, and again, uh, if you look at our transformation, we sort of started in the red part around 10 years ago. So we started with an agile transformation and we did it at scale. So we currently have over 250 agile lines uh, across our enterprise, across all 20 or so business areas. So at that point, you might think, you know, we're done. We've kind of mastered this. But, but really, when you take a step back, you realize, no, this is really just the start of the journey, right? Because you still have that flow of work into the teams. I mean, we were seeing that many times, you know, a significant amount of time was spent before a story ever got into the backlog of an agile team. And so that orange part or that release planning component is very important to be able to visualize and also flow work to your teams. And then once your iterations were done, we weren't deploying into production. We still had a lot of work to do through various environments in order to in a sense, certify what we now call certify that release for um, production. So. The green part of the value stream is another a component that's very important because we want to be able to take kind of that payload, that set of stories that are going into that application release and understand, you know, we want to do our security scans, we want to do our sonar cube, we want to be able to automate some of the certifications through our tooling in order to then say this is ready and then once it's ready, um, do, for example, an integration with ServiceNow for our change request so that we can automate that as much as possible to deploy it into production so that then we can get the feedback. How did this really function from a value perspective? Were we, were, are we really doing what we thought we were going to do from, from that business capability? And based on that, we can make adjustments and continue to turn the crank. So this is kind of a view of our integrated delivery pipeline. And it kind of, like any kind of lean concept that starts with your work intake. So going back to the Phoenix project, you have different types of work. In our case, our business value work comes from clarity, our defects 
or unplanned work, if you will, from the Phoenix Project story come from Quality Center, and then we have operations types of work that, that can come from ServiceNow. Um, that flows through various integrations, which I'll show in a little more detail today, through TaskTop into the rest of our pipeline. So we have the rational tools um, at the front of our pipeline, which then feed into the urban code tools. Um, as you can see, there's other components here, right? There's, there's the build component, there's information around um, testing results and things that we, that we show through UCR. And eventually, once we have that readiness for deployment, we wanna, we wanna then get that feedback and then see you know, what, what should we be doing, help the business plan for the next release. Um, so you know, when you put all this together, you're sort of achieving kind of that promise of the three ways, right? You, you not only have the flow of work integrated through th various uh, task top capabilities here. So like we can flow kind of the product backlog work into our agile teams. You know, we can flow information from defects, so they automatically go into the backlog of our teams. And then we can flow, you know, once we're building, you know, we want to know what is really in that build and how is that flowing through our pipeline all the way out to deployment, and then eventually automate that change request so we can reduce as many of these manual interactions today that are slowing us down. And we can have trust in what we're doing because, you know, we have confidence in the data you know, we're not looking in various tools for the data. Um, we're not building our own point-to-point -point connections for these different capabilities. We can trust the solution that we have and the data that's, all, that's gonna be current, and then we can make determinations and automate some of those things to accelerate our delivery. So here's an example of our kind of schematic diagram and a few of the things that I just talked about. So, you know, today um, we take our defects and they're automatically synced into the backlogs of our agile teams, right? So in Quality Center, a defect can be assigned and it can go into that product backlog and then the product owner can help determine what should be the priority to feed that through that team. And so any of the previous either email conversations, I mean, a lot of things you will see as you get more lean is you don't have to have all these status meetings and all those meetings that I know, I'm sure everybody here in the audience loves to go to, right? Let's have some more meetings. It's, it's all automated. It's all part of your natural work progress. You're going to have a stand up. Okay, well, now you have some defects that you may decide to bring in to this iteration and, bring in, and pull that information through as part of your uh, you know, process. Another integration that we take advantage of is, as Nicole had referred to before, is the requirements, right? So we take our requirements out of doors next generation and we can sync those into quality centers so you know you have test case to write against. Um, we can take some of this business value work I talked about and sync that into the RTC area. So again, you have that flow of work into your agile teams from whatever the work intake is. So the beauty of all this is, for example, uh, last week we, we showed a demo of, of a view in urban code release and everything I pointed to in urban code release, whether it was our defects or, or the work, the actual um, stories or, um, you know, even, even information um, relating to the requirements, everything there had been entered in the source of record. Nothing was entered in urban code release and yet it was all visible there. And I think that's a pretty powerful example of how you can take advantage of these integrations. So then in the future, as I talked about, we see a lot of other opportunities, right? We want to integrate security scans into our pipeline. Um, so, you know, getting things like app scan results, we want to, we want to integrate the change process with ServiceNow. You know, we, there's other things here that we can integrate to start to eliminate any kind of manual activities that we have and empower our teams really to be able to deliver more quickly for their business. And, and get rid of a lot of the centralized command and control structures today that, that had a need in the past when you were doing things in more of a waterfall way. But if you're, as you move to an agile way, you really want to empower those teams closest to the business and allow them to deliver as quickly as possible. And these kinds of solutions allow that to happen. 
One final note about this, is, as I talked a little about, is our goal is to minimize lead time. Well, before you can see if an experiment actually was successful in minimizing it, it'd be nice if you could measure it, right? So it's very difficult to measure this today. Um, I don't really know of many companies that actually measure true lead time from that customer concept all the way through the delivery of that capability to their customer. Um, so now, if you can, as you see here, we kind of have three streams. We have that value stream, as I talked about, right, which has the work intake and then through the planning, the agile design develop, and then the certification process. But then you have the process, right? So you have, again, from that business initiative, you know, you, you're scheduling that work for a given release, you're doing your builds, um, you're going through your different types of CI and then tests to certify that until you say it's ready for production. And then you sort of can see from a, a tool perspective, right, TaskTop through these integrations and then in the future through the hub will have access to a lot of this information automatically in one place. Right? So today, if you wanted to try to measure this, you would have to say, well, when did we start doing that work in Clarity and try to get some information from there? When did the Agile team start to work on it and try to get some information out of the rational tools? And then when did we start to build this? Well, I don't know. There's probably some information we can mine out of Urban Code Release. And finally, when do we say it was ready to go you know, and deploy? And that, as you can tell, would be very manual and would probably be inefficient and would be very hard to you know, scale across, in our case, you know, thousand, over a thousand applications. So with the capabilities that we have today, we're starting to see that, that with TaskTop Sync and TaskTop Data, we can start to provide this capability uh, ourselves through looking at where that stream of data takes us, right? So we can see that, for example, this, this change might have been created on 6.1, got into the backlog of the team, got through the team very quickly, but then we had to do some builds, we had to do some certifications, and eventually it was ready for production, right? And sometimes we have to wait for a change window even when we're ready because of the way we're currently structured. So and this is just for illustration, but in this case, it's 132 days, which um, whether that's good or whether that's bad, obviously we like to improve it. And again, it's not a real number, but it just shows you though all the power of seeing not just what that lead time is, but you can start to see kind of well, you know, looking at different processes in your value stream, maybe what took so long, right? So, so in this example, you would say, well, gee, we were pretty good at getting this into a iteration and getting it out. But then, you know, it took us a while to actually get all the testing certifications that we needed until it was ready for production. And then we still waited a few weeks for a change window. So it starts to give you some insight into your bottlenecks because, as, as you know, right, you really need to focus on improving your bottlenecks if you're going to improve this end-to-end -end capability. So with that, uh, thanks again. It was uh, my pleasure to be here, and I'll hand it back to Mick. Thank you, Carmen. Um, so we're going to skip right ahead to Mark Wanish. Uh, when I met Mark, he was creating, I think, one of the most interesting and largest agile transformations that, that I got to witness. And just like the same thing, Carmen asked me at one point, you know, why can't we measure lead time across these tool chains? Why aren't other companies doing this? And the answer is this shocking no. No one's actually measuring end-to-end -end lead time today. Something's deeply wrong because people keep investing in hiring developers and these other initiatives. They don't know the, where those are actually relieving the bottleneck that they have in, in their value stream. Um, you know, Mark needed to basically create this transformation of in, within a lot of legacy in a large organization that was doing a lot of waterfall. And he asked me provocative questions such as, you know, how do I measure uh, cost per story point? Which again, you would think is one of the most basic things, but he'll tell you some of the lessons learned through that journey of both a cultural transformation and needing to have this ecosystem of, of tools to support that, so. All right, thanks, Mick. Excited to, excited to be here today, and I think what What's the, you know, I've been doing this uh, leading agile transformations for about 10 years now, and or the better part of a decade. And, and as we do this, I've been using TaskTop in many bits from the earlier versions of Sync through eventually Link, Data, others. Uh, so Hub is actually very exciting um, because it's really enabled enabled my team to, to really have the successes that we've had over the time. I think you look, um, 
and yes, Mick did know the title when I when I put this up here. I'm obviously not going to say don't waste your money, don't do it. This is silly. Uh, but there is as absolutely a, a don't waste your money aspect to this, and in, in an area where you know we've been around for agile transformations or the agile concept has been around for about 20 years now, or or longer. And as you look at it, you know you hear now in every conference, anyone, anytime you'll go to it, everyone's raving success. Everyone you talk to is is agile these days, and. Some will say, I'm Agile. Look, I shortened my meeting from 30 minutes to 15. Woohoo, check me out. But the, <laughs> but the reality is that's, that it's so much more than that. And when, if you're not going all in, if it's a technology-only effort, if it's these things, because we go and talk to you know, other CIOs. People will come and talk to me, and largely they'll say, well, wow, everyone's got it. And you'll say, no, we absolutely don't. Um, people are still failing. And there are a common set of uh, characteristics for people who succeed, uh, as well as people who are failing. And as you, as you look at each of those things, uh, the, the fun part I had with this conversation was there's a strong parallel to the health and fitness area. And so where we are in the year, everyone gets around January and says, I'm going to have my New Year's resolution. So we're January 31st. So if you look, the number one resolution that people made going into the new year was they want to become fit. They want to become healthy. January 31st right now, depending on what you go Google search it, depending on what you come back with, you're somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 66 or 50, half to two thirds have already failed, have already bailed from their commitment and, and it's not working. Not that they didn't want to, they just didn't commit to it. And so as we look at it, you say, wow, these people are, these people are out there getting fit. Well, what's their secret for the people who it actually does work for? And the common threads across it are, and, and these are common sense guys, I'm not, this isn't, we're not solving world hunger with this one. It's exercise. You have to work out. You have to do something to get in shape. You can't eat garbage all the time and expect yourself to be healthy and fit. And there's an aspect of genetics to it, but the piece, and the reason we put genetics in there is not everyone's going to look like those rock stars in the back or a super someone on the you know cover of Health and Fitness or Muscle Magazine. But you can always get to the best version of yourself. And that's the same thing with, with these transformations is how do you enable yourself to say, I'm going to be better than I am today. And I'm going to go out and I'm actually going to accomplish something where I'm improving on what I've got. And that's now not just in health and fitness. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this conversation. A lot of, convers a lot of companies out there are doing it well. I bet everyone's surprised to see Google up there as one of those people. Wow, Google's doing this well. Yeah, OK. Some of the internet companies uh, and, and the more digital companies that you see out there, it makes sense. Nationwide actually had it up there before I met Carmen. Capital One, you start looking at some of these and that the key thing that's changed for them in a lot of cases, because you can say the same thing, what's their secret, is they all have a vision. They all set a goal to say, I'd like to be here. This is how I want to improve myself to be the best, best version of myself. They also create a culture that really starts to change that mindset from you know, the, the master-slave uh, relationship often that business and technology organizations have, which is, I gave you my requirements, go do my work, and I'll tell you if it's right, to a creative, you know, we enable the teams, execution teams, which is all functional areas coming together and then doing these things. And, and it, when you change that mindset and that culture, what it gets into is you have leaders now and, and people who are in a command and control managing role who have shifted over to now I'm leading and enabling. And that's, that's a key part to this as you go through each of these. And so what we did in, in my organization is we looked and said, what's that tip to tail? What's the idea to implementation look like and where would we address that? Because the other thing you're seeing is people will come out and they'll, they'll tell you, well, you know, we need to do an agile transformation. This that I'm showing on the screen, which shows that life cycle or that system, has really three phases. You've got the idea part where they're you know, setting a vision, gathering the requirements, creating a backlog which then it gets kind of handed off to the developers. Developers will do their work, and then ultimately you go into your release and your third phase of that, where almost all these companies start is, well, let me go right to the developers and make them better. Not saying that development organizations don't all have opportunities to improve and become more optimal, but the reality is nine times out of 10, it's either the front end of this or it's the back end. And so what we did is we, we worked very closely with our business to get there on the front end, but started realizing, if you go back to Mech's deck from earlier, all those little explosions in between each phase, what we realized was my developers, my team, as we said, our organization's mindset and culture is going to change and it's going to focus on everyone in this organization, regardless of what your role is, is directly aligned and is, is supposed to be adding business value in everything they do. We found that over 50% of people's time was spent in, in doing non-business value add things. I, I'm unlike um, where Carmen is, I'm, I'm the business technology organization, so I, I lead teams that are delivering directly facing with the business and actually, you know, 
putting capabilities out that, you know, for, for a period of time was running, we got about 150 to 200 million hits uh, a month on our on the web, website. So highly trafficked, had the whole sales process, and as it went through those, a lot of different things we had to do to become more efficient. And what we found is we were spending most of our time just trying to get the code into production and trying to hand it off from one person to the next to actually go. And that artifact moving along it was was very painful. So we said, all right, let's let's take a look at what our DevOps ecosystem was or what it looked like for us to release. What are the tool sets we're using? You guys aren't going to see any on there here that you don't already know. Um, when we initially started this conversation, we we had been on Rally. That was helping enable our, our transformation. Sync wasn't there yet, so we you know had some direct direct integrations. Ultimately, came and put Tasktop in place. And as Mick and I were having some of these conversations, we said, look, in order for us to be better, in order for us to transform and take it to the next level, we need to start using things like Selenium. And the number of scenarios we can get driven through there versus our, our traditional testing tools I couldn't just continually doing that. You know, we had Link and others that would that would eventually help us with that. But as we went through this whole process, we started to figure out that those integrations, and as I took it out of my developers' hands, as my the, my DevOps team no longer had to do each and every one of those steps day in and day out, it gave us the opportunity to really gain efficiency. So the amount of true, the amount of work didn't change, the amount of business value changed dramatically. And that was the part where everyone easily said, hey, look at the value you're getting um, from the systems you've put in place, and you really saw the mindset shifting. You saw the mindset shift as as people focused on, let me get that business value out. And so one of the things as you look at it, it will kind of wrap here in the next couple of minutes, but all of these transformations, you can look across anyone who starts down this path and say, what are those things that are going to cause you to fail? What are some, you know, warning red flag things to look for? You know, I mentioned it before. If you're coming into this saying, by God, I'm a, a technology organization and I'm going to change. If you don't have others, if you're not with your business partners, if you're not with the rest of the organization, this is very seldom successful when it's a completely bottoms up or inside from technology only driven event. This has to be execution teams and that's where you go. If you don't go all in, the other one is you have a lot of people will say, yeah, we'll change this or, and this is one of the ones we have had these conversations with my bosses, which are CIOs and others and said, look, you, you want this all to change. That's great. But the reality is you also have to change. So you can't just, you know, it's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's, that's what you hear from senior leaders, although they want to see the results of the change. And, and the organization has to go in. Otherwise, what they'll find is it's too easy to, to bail out and fall back to what they were doing. And, and lastly, you look at, you know, the subject, subjective decision making. A lot of people will, you know, you do work based on which executive yells the loudest or which one comes in and is the most forceful around, I need this and I need it now. And, and this really started uh, the, the ecosystem that we set up and the culture was, it, that's fine, we can do that, but we do want to show you what value you left on the table. And the fact that we did something that didn't add value or was a lower value add, we now have the data and the metrics to be able to show and have that conversation uh, down the road. And there are many others, you can see some at the bottom. And, and lastly, we'll get into, if, you, if you're thinking about going on that, uh, this journey and actually embarking here, let's have the discussion and say, what, what do I need to do? Small list of five things, you know, start, have a vision, right? Create, create an organizational structure. Don't just continue doing things the way you are and expect things will change. So you want to find, you know, give people a North Star to run to, structure them in a way, and then, you know, all the way through these others, but ultimately give them the tool sets, enable them, and, and leaders shift what they're doing today, which is, managing and command and control to enable your teams. Give them the autonomy. They're smart people. If they weren't, get, if they're not, get rid of them and hire the right people. Um, and I know that sounds crass, but at the end of the day, we're, we're in a business. It's only fair to the people if they're in a role that doesn't make sense for them to have that true and, and honest conversation. It really is better for everyone around, not just that individual, but the rest of the team who would be carrying that person's load. But at the end of the day, put those tools in place where they can, again, get focused on every single day, delivering business value and not focus on things that are just, you know, detractors and taking away from the money you're spending. So appreciate, again, appreciate the time. This is an exciting time for us with Integration Hub and uh, how, how much easier each of these things become as, as we really get to, get to driving this out. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks, Nicole. All right, so now we're going to switch over to the panel portion. Um, and uh, I think, Carmen, I'm going to start with you, and everyone can also jump in. I'll have a, a, a few questions. But 
Uh, I think one of the, the moments that really stands out for me in your presentations at DevOps Enterprise Summit is when you called out to a very large audience uh, that Agile and DevOps are local optimizations. And I think people cringed really uncomfortably. <laughs> and then you went on to explain that. But you know, can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Because I, I do think it's a shift in, in how organizations need to think that, that you've taken, that some of these other uh, colleagues of ours have taken, that, that many organizations have not yet. So. Yeah, um, of course, any time I talk, people cringe, Mick, so that wasn't a... <laughs> but, um, so I, I think when I was describing our journey, you know, again, it was about, we had been successful with the Agile transformation, um, but again, if you're really not looking across your value stream and really understanding your bottleneck, right, you can end up with a lot of siloed local optimization. So a lot of people have great ideas on how to make things better. Right, and, and if they're, you're sitting in your silo, wherever it is in that value stream, you can think of a way to do things better. And, and Deming used to talk about those things, you know, quality circles and things like that. And the practitioners do understand best how to improve the areas that they work on, right? It's management doesn't, I'll just speak for myself. I mean, I'm not the one who's gonna tell, tell my team how to code better or do automated testing or whatever, right? That's, that's, their, that's what they're good at. That's what they're gonna provide. But then there's this concept of a systems thinking that Deming would talk about. And that's where you have to be able to take those results and say, okay, you have to get outside the system a little bit. And so that's where you have to have this value stream perspective to say, if I actually improve this, am I going to make it better, right? I, I don't know if how many people have worked at like something like a, a food bank where maybe you're packing goods, you know, so someone's making the boxes and everyone's putting in their, you know, the fruits and the vegetables and whatever and, and do it, right? And, and if you've ever worked there, it becomes very clear that, um, you know, if the problem, like I've had sometimes where I have all these heavy cans I'm trying to put in the box and so all the boxes are stacking up here and everybody to the right of me is like saying, come on, Carmen, let's get going. <laughs> Having more people make boxes at that point and come up with new ways to make boxes isn't really going to help because the boxes are already up here, right? I need help, right? So if you don't have that perspective that that's your bottleneck, fix your bottleneck, you know, you could create a lot of local optimizations that in a sense are waste, right? Because if I start creating more wa more boxes, that's inventory, that's waste. That's like putting more stories in the backlog or, or having more builds that can't go anywhere because I can't get them through the rest of my deployment capability. So um, it's having that value stream and applying those lean concepts, I think, that's important. And that's why I think that visibility is such a key to that. Thank you, Carmen. Yeah, I think this is one of the things we discovered in our discussions yesterday. It's, it's the combination of systems thinking and empowered practitioners you know, that we really want to get to. And, and I think that that's exactly what we're all after and doing that at, at scale. And I think, Jackie, you, the fascinating thing about Comcast, I think this is, this is true for all of your organizations, but is just the sheer scale of software delivery and development that's at Comcast. So if you could just tell us a bit about that and, uh, and looking at your tool chain, you know, the decision that, how you made that decision to, to get the task up integration hub and why, and really the, the sort of scales that you deal with day to day in terms of your application and IT stack. Sure, so, um, you know, about six months ago, we had a massive reorganization within Comcast where we merged two uh, quite large organiza uh, engineering organizations together, and now we're, we're one engineering organization. And when that happened, we realized that there was a quite overabundance of multiple tool sets, right? And so now, you know, I went from six tool sets to almost 50 tool sets, and I'm trying to get that down. And what we're finding, you know, from the scale is, you know, we have 22 instances of Splunk. We have seven instances of JIRA. We have multiple instances of um, Confluence and, and so on and so forth. And, and what we're trying to do is, you know, we're trying to scale the products to support the customers that we serve. My customers are internal Comcast engineers, field operations, you know, folks. Um, but we're also trying to be a little bit more sensible about what we're doing. Um, we're trying to make sure that data is able to get passed through each of the multiple instances of you know, an application. And then once that's done, we're able to, 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 to pass it through to other applications. So where TaskTop comes in is gonna help us to leverage that, whether that is 
supporting the integrations between JIRA and QC or Rally and, you know, JIRA, whatever that may be, we're looking to be able to leverage anything that we can do to make things simple, fast, and easy. And so we came to you guys and you're able to help us now. We've, we're, we're only a week in on, on our relationship, right? So, uh, um, but so far it's been pretty good. We did the EA with you guys um, over the last couple months and that's been working out really well, so. Great, thank you, Jackie. And thanks again to you and Comcast for, for participating in that, in that EA program of the, of the integration hub. So, Mark, I think you know, Jackie's had a, what appears to be a very well-organized transformation, I think, a, across Comcast. You, you created this, this bubble within your organization, and you know, there were a lot of different tools and processes that you had to connect to in order to prove out what you were doing and do it incrementally and then build it up and up. And again, it's, I think it's one of the shining examples of how to do things the right way. Can you talk about how you, you, know, how you work with those, those opposing forces of the traditional old governed, every defect has to be over here, or you're getting shut down, uh, way of looking at things, uh, and how you approach kind of creating this bubble, but growing it successfully. I think we've seen a lot of bubbles grow and then get shut down too early before they really demonstrate business results. Yeah, it's, uh, the, for me, the biggest one was it was, it really came down to setting the vision, understanding where we were going, having, uh, I had a very strong, and I built a, a strong leadership team and a strong team of folks around me. Um, there was a, in, in some cases, just a fight day in and day out to help convince people uh, and, and where it really became successful was when we started to have the, have the data there, have the, be able to gain that trust by demonstrating, by showing. Um, and so you create that culture, that mindset of everything we're doing, and I mentioned this a minute ago, is driven by business value. And so when we go and have these conversations with the different organizations and, and where uh, that slide you showed with all those, and I'm going to go back to the one with all the explosions in between those in, in some organizations, even here at Tasktop or, or other startups, you'll see that those are, are functional um, explosions, right? Some people have this responsibility to do that. In larger organizations, 250,000 people with you know 40,000 people in technology, those are organizations. Those Each one of those is, and, and when you say, I, give me this control, give me this power because I know I can do it, you've now told someone I don't need you or your job. That's a function, not a role. And that became something that people were very threatened by and, and dug in. As, you started to, as we started to put this tool set together and say, look, here's where you can add value to me. And you kind of started to create that kind of team concept instead of you know, a very serial manufacturing uh, kind of organization and process, that's where people started to come together and start to buy in, and then they saw the results. And, and it became less of a technology team trying to make their bubble grow. And I think we started at 25 people, and you know, by the time I left, we were at, you know, went up to 500, we were down to 350 or so. And it was, we were managing $50 million worth of, of business initiatives um, and pushing out quite a bit of change. And so it really came to getting more and more people saying everything drives some business value and the business was demanding, hey, I need you to go quicker and they can do it, so don't stop them. And that, that's one of those where we became one team, one organization, and then everyone started to get in line to say, I wanna be a part of this and I wanna you know, help enable it to go quickly. Okay, great, thanks, Mark. Uh, Nicole, you joined TASTOP five years ago um, and we, we're kind of outsized in terms of our complexity with you know, supporting 51 different tools right now, countless OEMs and resellers and so on. And uh, we had some demands in terms of moving faster and measuring things like mean time to resolution and so on. Uh, so I think a lot of what we've established in TAST that you've created both with, on the technology side with the integration hub, but our process as well, uh, has been extremely valuable. So can you tell us how, how you approach looking at measuring business value, planning it into the, you know, basically this end-to-end -end value stream? Sure, yeah, and it's a, an, an interesting, um, it's an interesting problem when you have a, a product that is actually dependent on now 51 other products. <laughs> um, so we have uh, a, a team of product managers, but you think one product manager, one product, we have product managers that essentially are managing, I guess, 52 products, yep. you'd call it. Um, and so we've spent a tremendous amount of time figuring out, really with these lean concepts in mind, how to create that uh, the, the value stream that can accommodate the complexity of having APIs from 51 different tools. And so we've essentially um, 
uh, some of our engineers didn't like this when we called it a factory, <laughs> but it is a factory because we needed to be able to have very small time to resolution when an API changes overnight. Right, and so we have um, some pretty sophisticated uh, processes in engineering that allows for a defect to come in and go to resolution um, because, of course, not surprisingly, we use TaskTop um, to flow information between teams. So, so that's how we've done it, is really paying attention to the, to the flows um, that are uh, most critical to get things from, from the ideas that, that customers like y'all give to us through all the way to, uh, to delivery. All right, thank you, Nicole. So just one last question for each of you in terms of you know, what you know, your next set of initiatives, what you're excited about bringing back to your organization and next steps in your, in your transformation. Uh, so what's the most interesting thing that you think you've got coming on the horizon on how can we best support that? Who wants to go first? Carmen, go. Well, I mean, I think you know, it's a journey, right? And where we are in the journey is we want to continue to, to be able to deliver that business value more quickly, right? As, uh, as Mark said, it's really about how responsive can we be, right? So, so I think I'm excited by the fact that we're, we're now getting to the point where we can run these experiments and actually start to measure, you know, how quickly we can go, what parts can we go more quickly at, how much more automation can we do, and, and how much more confidence can we have in those results based on, on that visibility and that automation so that we can, we can actually start to get people, you know, our business, our, our profound knowledge, as Deming would say, is really around solving those business problems, right? It's not around doing point-to-point -point integrations. It's not around, you know, doing some of the things that are taking away from that in terms of duplicate entry of information or meetings that we don't need and things like that. So the more we can remove that and, and the more we can focus on actually providing business value, then you know, that's exciting because we'll actually be able to fulfill that promise, I think, of, of running experiments, um, getting that response, and then delivering best for our customer uh, to, you know, you know as, one, as we talk about, you know, our role is really to protect the things that are most important to our customers and, and including their financial future. So the more we can have our associates working in that space and the less on you know, things that really aren't adding that business value, uh, you know, that's going to position us well moving ahead. And so for us, I mean, we saw earlier, the and, and Mick put this up, was the fintech disruptors. And you look at how many of those are out there, but quite frankly, that same view can be shown for ALM tool sets and for other efficiency gaining things. And for me, the thing that's most exciting is we, we have the opportunity to now go back and take each of these and say, this is best in breed. You take something like a, a JAMA or a Blueprint and, and use that as, to do your storytelling and to capture that piece of it uh, as it feeds into the rest of these. And each one of these things that keeps popping up, um, we now have the opportunity to more seamlessly just integrate that in, create efficiencies for our team in their day to day in those, each of those daily tasks that helps get them to the area that they're subject matter experts on. And I, I don't wanna waste my time trying to build integrations when you guys have enabled that. Or I don't want to go out and try and create every aspect of, of you know, the life cycle when I can take best and breed, plug them together, and then allow this to move more efficiently so I can do things like building you know, customer-based, customer-centric financial services, features, functionality, and things that will help make and help allow us to deliver financial products and services to our customers more quickly, which is what my team is hired and built to do. And uh, this, this integration, the, the seamless nature of this really gets us at doing that uh, quickly. So that's what I'm excited about. Thank you. So I think I'm excited about, um, you know, continuing the cultural change that we have going on at Comcast. I think that um, collaboration is key, more key now than it has, ever has been before. So whether you're in the agile world or in the waterfall world, I don't think that that really matters to me as, as much as it does of how you're communicating what your needs are and how we're communicating how we can help solve those problems. Um, my big focus for this year, as I had shared with you guys yesterday, is around self-service. What can I do to give the power back into the people's hands to help themselves? Most engineers, most field operations folks don't want to wait for someone on my team or anyone else to take 
an hour or two or 24, 48 to get back on something that may be something that they can work themselves. And so we're, we're trying to figure out a lot of self-service opportunities. And in doing that, that's going to come around with some governance practices that we have to put in place to make sure that we're, you know, although we're giving you, giving the, 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 the teams the capabilities of doing something, we're putting some guidelines in play so that we're not breaking systems. We're not um, causing integration outages. We're not, you know, taking down systems and we're being responsible. We're being careful and responsible about our applications and our systems because as, you, as Nicole just mentioned, you know, when your system went down last week, the havoc that it causes is so much worse than actually just following a process, right? So I think that's what I'm really gonna be continue to be focused on, the cultural chains and, and, and self-service, and just figuring out how do we make our integrations of our applications more seamless um, so that the teams can do their jobs more efficiently and simply and um, get our products and services out the door faster. Excellent, thank you. Can I ask you a question? No. I was going to ask you what you now the launch is done. What's no. Nicole going to do? Yeah, no, no, I don't. <laughs> um, yeah, now I'm going to ask you a question. So we've been working towards this for quite some time, as you know. Um, but I'd like to know why you think this is just the beginning rather than the end. Oh, so, okay, that is an interesting question. So I think, yeah, we've been, it's, it's taken us, somehow it's taken us quite a, quite a few years to get to this point where we've created the right set of abstractions to really you know, start on a path of both allowing our customers to innovate and connecting all these tools. But what gets very exciting is once you've got this layer in place, and Carmen showed us glimpses of this and nationwide, what you can do with all that information. The fact that you finally got, get that level of visibility and traceability and connectivity for software delivery, that, that same kind of visibility you have when, you know, when you're an individual developer on a team, you know exactly what's going on, you know exactly what your customers like, what's resonating, what isn't. For me, that, that all came from open source development, where you have that closed feedback loop with, with building great things. And what we can do now that all these organizations are going to put together this infrastructure, connect all their tools, raise that level of abstraction to these, to these value stream models that we're providing, uh, we're going to be able to build some great things on that uh, down the road and, and show you some amazing things happening uh, for the rest of the year. So I'd really like to thank all the teams that put together this launch and put together, create the TASTOP integration hub um, across TASTOP, our customers who are just doing really amazing things and leading the industry to where we all need to be in terms of efficiency of software delivery at scale, and uh, the, the whole product team and, and marketing for me and so on. So thank you all, and check out TASLAB.com for more. <laughs>